past and present from the world of pro wrestling. A new day is dawning for DX. And now, your host, Sean X Pac Wolfman. What's going on, everyone? This is X Pac 12360. I'm your host, Sean X Pac Wolfman. And it's still hard for me to get used to the new intro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not the only one. Yeah. Anyways, anyways, <laughs> all righty there. When it ended, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Anyways, we, the new intro. I'm still having a, a little bit of a time getting acclimated with it because you know I'm the one that asked for it and I wanted it done. And uh, now, like, I'm, I'm used to the old one and I'm used to getting all like you know the 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 DX based you know baseline and all that. Dump. Yeah. So, anyways. Uh, we're gonna have a great show today, and uh, the guest is gonna be Marty Skrull, yeah. the villain. Yeah, Ooh. hell yeah. Long live the villain. Yeah, and uh, uh, I want to thank Stone Cold Steve Austin for coming on last week on the one year anniversary show. Nice. Yes. Yeah, and uh, glad to have Bill Hanstock back. Hey. Yeah. How was I'm, your? I'm, oh. a, I'm, a, I'm exactly a correct substitute for Steve Austin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I got more hair than him this week. Than yeah. Just well, this we week. missed you. Thanks, man. And I how, was, y'all too. how was your cruise? It was awesome. I, I think I'm a cruise guy now. Okay. Oh. Yeah. It's all you know. cruise? Just takes one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so on the couch, we've got Jimbo. What's up, Sean? And we have the lovely Denise Salcedo. Hey, everyone. In between them, we got Lula, <laughs> baby Lula. Aww. She's up there. She's hanging out with you guys now yeah. during yeah, the show, like so you can't hear her snoring. <laughs> She's like, I need camera time. And a beautiful TK Trinidad. Hey. And um, so what's going on today? TK? Huh? What's TK? going on today? <laughs> I was like, oh, this is what, okay, cool. Um, so, oh, that's me. I'm TK. <laughs> I definitely want to talk about, have you seen the May Young Classic? I know Denise has, because yeah. we're on a show together. Yeah, yeah we yeah. did the after show together. Yeah, I've seen my share, but I haven't, I've not sat down and watched the, like every episode, you know, beginning, beginning to end or anything. What do you think of it so far, the stuff that you have seen? Uh, there's some really good stuff, and then there's some stuff that's not particularly stellar. Just yeah. to be a hundred percent honest with you, but I, I'm still happy they give the the ladies the, uh, you know, opportunity to go out there and showcase their stuff. Just some of them are some still a bit green. Prize. Well, that's yeah. that was my main thing. It's like you have 32 women, and the premise of it was, you know, we're getting the best women all throughout the world, and you've traveled the world, and you've yes. kind of seen it all. Is there more? The women that they picked out, there were some of them that weren't, I don't think they were ready for that particular Correct. forum. Do you think there are women that they may have missed? Oh, definitely. There's definitely uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, female talent out there that they missed. And that just probably just they weren't able to get, you know, okay. and because there's a lot of excellent ladies down in Mexico, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it probably just wasn't happening as far as getting, you know, getting any of them, like, to be lent, lent to them from, you know, whatever respective promotions they work for. Yeah, because some of the matches I just felt yeah. like, oh, okay, we could have did without her. Yeah, and then, you know, all these different style clashes, and I didn't mean to, no pun intended, for the AJ Styles right. finish. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, like, uh, uh, for instance, yeah, okay, like, okay, I'll just say this. My my favorite uh, competitor in the May Young Classic so far is Shayna Baszler. Yeah, yeah. Yes. She's awesome. She yeah. And she's being positioned like that. That's right. And she's doing what and what she's doing in, in when the bell rings in between bells is perfect. Yeah. Uh, about as close to perfect as you can get for what I think she needs to do uh, for you know somebody that's you know transitioning from MMA to to pro wrestling and yeah. and, and and using that as their image that that they're an MMA person. Yeah. So well, it's like what we talked to uh, Alistair Black about. Yeah. And she's doing all those things right. Yeah. Just like Matt Riddle's done all those things. That's right. right. I was actually talking, sitting outside at uh, PWG uh, Battle of Los Angeles this weekend, and uh, I was talking with Matt Riddle, and she actually walked up. Jaina did. And, you know, I was telling her right from that, I'm like, I keep on doing what you're doing in the ring mm-hmm. because just like this guy right here pointing to Matt Riddle, I'm like, you're staying true. To what I believe, like uh, somebody from your world, should how you should uh, work in the ring. And the thing too I like about her is the fact that uh, she's no, she's no, she's 
she's been in the business as far as um, MMA and stuff for a long period of time, but she's not coming into WWE. Like, I've been here, I've fought, I, I deserve this. She's kind of working up the ranks because yeah. you see a little bit of her um, throughout the years, so I definitely am excited about her. But uh, during the challenge, there was a big challenge from Rod Ronda Rousey and the four horsemen, horsewomen, yeah, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of excited about that. I think that everybody's been talking about Ronda. She, she hasn't officially retired, but everybody's kind of been talking about her going into WWE. So I think this might be the thing. I actually read something where somebody was saying, is there going to be a credibility issue with Ronda? Like, as if, like, her losses in MMA... Uh, take away from her credibility. Let me tell you something. Like, it, 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 no matter what, like that's Ronda Rousey. Yeah. No matter what happened, mm -hmm. and and she could wipe the floor with pretty much anyone. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe not. Okay, there's a lot of tough people in wrestling, male and female. So I mean, it wouldn't be too. It wouldn't be like a walk in the park. She but, could definitely hold her own, though. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And I think that's obviously part of the reason why they're having Shayna go all the way to the top of this uh, tournament is specifically for the horsewoman to basically go against each other. And I think that we might be able to see that hopefully at Survivor Series. That would probably be the smart thing to yeah. do. But uh, it is pretty interesting to see them like kind of like face to face. And that's kind of the cool stuff about yeah. the Mae Young tournament. You get to see all that. Yeah, she, she had to take a break from obviously a lot, like just kind of separate herself. And then she just recently got married. So it's just kind of like take a moment. And I think this would be a definitely good uh, good move for her. But yeah, we will see. She should do it. If it makes her happy, she should do it. <laughs> She's going to, I mean, it's going to happen eventually. They're already teasing the four horsewomen versus four horsewomen. Right. Yeah. But do you see her doing it on a regular, like the travel schedule? Because I don't, that's the only no. thing I don't no. see her She's doing. She's an attraction. Yeah. yeah. She's going to be the Brock, well, not quite Brock Lesnar's schedule, but I think she's going to have like similar to like what the Hardy Boys have, if not less than that. Yeah, probably, probably less. less than that. Yeah, she'll yeah. wrestle on Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that was an interesting tweet. So what's next? Um, so somebody that we actually had on our show, they're injured. And it was kind of breaking news because Bill told us when. Uh, I mean, it's not necessarily. I mean, it, it, the news came out yesterday, late late yesterday. Um, Wrestling Observer was the first people to report on it. Um, he has a lateral meniscus uh, issue in his left knee. Kenny Omega is who we're talking Sorry, about. Sorry, Kenny Omega, the the cleaner, uh, the <laughs> Bullet Club leader. Uh, everyone's wearing Bullet Club shirts today. No, uh, especially the, TK. The black shirt. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> He's got an issue in his left knee with his lateral meniscus. Um, no word on whether it's a tear or a sprain um, or, or anything like in depth, but New Japan confirmed it. Uh, they didn't say much. He's gonna. They're, they're currently about to start the Road to Destruction tour, uh, which is gonna lead up to the Destruction event in um, Kobe. Uh, he's gonna be off the whole tour, but he's still set to defend the IWGP United States Championship against Juice Robinson at Destruction on, I believe, September 24th, and he's gonna be replaced on the tour by the third son of Haku, who's uh, making his big uh, entrance there, Leo Tonga, who is six foot eight. We haven't seen him yet? Not not as far as I know. Yeah. He's been at the New Japan jo Dojo and he trained uh, at the Dudley Academy, 3D yeah. Academy, um, but he's the tallest member of the New Japan roster and uh, he's gonna be teaming with the Gorillas of Destiny against uh, Juice and uh, War Machine. Oh, okay. First, uh, first stop on that tour. Do some War Machine, huh? Interesting the pairing there. Well, just because it was it was going to be Kenny who's feeding with Juice against the War Machine who's feeding yeah. with the Gorillas. So, huh. I'm really sad to hear that. I, I, it doesn't sound like a, a, a serious uh, injury, or or, 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 or we wouldn't be hearing about him defending a, still defending the title. Well, is there a chance that he's just working that show to drop the title if he's like significantly injured? Like the, he, he's good enough to work one show? Because I know that, that wrestlers have done that a yeah. lot past. Yeah, yeah, sure, that could be it. But um, how is, is Kenny Omega, like I haven't really heard like what his rap is on far as like getting injured go. Like, I mean, he's had a few here and there, right? Yeah, but it's not, major. he doesn't have a history of a significant injury and mm -hmm. he's worked banged up uh, at times, but he's been actually really good at avoiding injury as far as, as far as indie wrestling. That's really goes, especially, important. Yeah. Especially with his style yeah. of how he wrestles. Yeah. I wonder if it happened this weekend at Bola. Because he only had one match at Bola, but it was a hell of a match. Or it could have been like a strain from like constant work at the G1. You know, finally your body's kind of taking a toll or, you know, something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, it's like a rubber band and it just... Yeah, because, yeah. yeah. you know, usually I feel like with with uh, knee injuries, they tend to be kind of like a freak accident. You can just kind of do a, a minor step wrong the wrong way and then it happens. You know, honestly, yeah. for me, like, 
I just think that as long as like Kenny focuses on not letting it affect him in terms of like maybe putting too much weight on the other leg and then oh you know something happens like that so I think that it's more just like a mental game now obviously you know do whatever the doctor tells him to do and stuff like that but knee injuries definitely have to be careful so as an indie wrestler as far as like medical because I know with the WWE they kind of you kind of go through all these medical um kind of clearances do you do the same thing with other um wrestling or organizations no. or you just <laughs> <laughs> especially not global force hey the, the, here's the here's how that works everywhere else it's like you know what we don't want to know okay i'm just being honest with you it's like you hey that's you that's on you like you know how you feel if there's something wrong with you like you shouldn't be wrestling you know like and i'm kind of like okay you know i'm for that Sort of. I mean, I'm, I mean, maybe not on the WWE scale right. where they can afford it, but like, you know, how how can you expect you know some of these companies to to do all that? That's a lot. Well, maybe just a clearance to because the thing is, if you have these minor ish, uh, injuries and with an athletic mindset, you're gonna just keep on going. So at least have that clearance of okay, well, you you can't. You can't do that, and you know he's an independent contractor. It's right. not the same as I mean, okay, technically WWE's independent contractors, mm -hmm. but they're exclusively contracting themselves to WWE. Right. This way is different. It's more free agent kind of stuff, and so like he's the one that has to decide that. No one else. He's his boss. Okay. No one's. No one is Kenny Omega's boss. Well, and WWE is doing that to protect their investment. I think Reckless Youth went to the, before it was the Performance Center, went to like OVW mm -hmm. and did like a springboard and blew out his knee, but his knee had already been screwed. Sure. It just happened there. And then WWE had to pay for it right. because yeah. it happened there. Yeah. So this is their way of covering their bases so that doesn't happen again. Yeah, and I, I'm all for them doing that. Like when when you get to that level as far as like, okay, doing like stress tests on the heart and mm -hmm. things like that. Because there's some guys that, ha or guys and ladies probably, that have found out some things about their health that they may not have otherwise found out right. that may have saved their lives. Definitely. You know, here's the thing about, like, okay, you hear about, uh, okay, oh, so-and-so was being looked at by WWE mm -hmm. or this person, you know, you know, they got a developmental deal, but then something fell through. You don't know. Like, a lot of times when, I'm well, not, Willie Mack. not even, I'm not mentioning any <laughs> names, okay? okay? <laughs> no name. I'm just saying that we don't know what they found out in those uh, in those uh, physicals yes. and all these tests mm -hmm. because there's HIPAA laws that prevent them from disclosing any of that. They would get their asses sued off. So some people are like, okay, um, they're so stupid for not bringing this guy in. They're a lot, you know. And I've been one to do that in the past. I just we don't know. You know the real reasons behind a lot of those things. So, anyways, back to what we were talking about. <laughs> well, that is what we were talking about. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, I love you, Sean. Um, so, um, Jeff Jared, uh, Jarrett, sorry, he is no longer. Well, kind of looking for a job. What's the? I don't know if he's looking for a job. You think he's, he's looking for a job? No. no. Well, he... You think he's good? Yeah, I think yeah. he's fine. Are you kidding me? <laughs> The judgment, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, when I heard about this, to tell you the truth, I was really sad because, you know, you know, obviously some people give TNA a bad rep, but the truth is they have some great stuff on there. The shows I've been to have been amazing, and I've honestly been a fan of Double J for for quite a while. I think what he was doing with the company was, you know, moving forward was great, and. You know, I was watching uh, Triple Mania when he came out and he, people were saying that, you know, he, he didn't look well, right? And um, it was a little strange how he was acting on there and people are saying that that's kind of the reason as to why this happened. But I just think that I'm really sad. But at the same time, oh, and I'm just kind of sad for the future of TNA, especially because right now uh, Jeff Jarrett still owns the 100% 100% name for the uh, for Global Force Wrestling. So it's like, what is going to happen? And I'm just kind of sad for the future or nervous yeah. for it, you know? And Anthem, Anthem, what are they called? Anthem. Anthem. Yeah, they're just... Like they're uh, ready to get rid of it, right? Well, I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out like who it was that told him that was a good idea to get in the wrestling business in the first place. <laughs> 
Well, I know they know? wanted the tape library. They they had a huge they they had like a huge investment or interest in uh, TNA's tape library. So I feel like if anything, that might be the thing that's kind of keeping them latching on to the company, and you know, hopefully, make some money in the future. Well, I mean, from strictly business standpoint, and and I'm happy they they put their money. I'm happy they you know got in the wrestling business because it's given you know a lot of people I know some paychecks. Uh, but like, from a business standpoint, it would have made better sense for them to just try to buy the uh, the tape library, you know. Uh, but I guess that was what WWE was trying to do, and and eventually, like I've said, like I said, I don't know how many years ago I said this. I put this in a tweet. Uh, you know, at the end of, at the end of this, WWE is is going to have TNA's you know uh, content on on WWE Network. That's how it's going to end up, Someday, inevitably. Yeah. Yeah. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Guarantee it. Take it to the bank and cash <laughs> it. So you think they should just cut their losses now and sell it to them right away and then start focusing with that money, rebranding, and doing something else? Yeah. 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 Yes. That's what Corgan wanted to do. Yes. That's what Billy Corgan wanted to do. He wanted to start start over. Sure. And I just I wish and... Billy would have just done that. Instead of saying, oh, I need to go in here and buy this mess of a business that's a just complete shambles well he might be trying to do that with the nwa name now and i'm I, you know like i i my hands off to him for doing that because he loves wrestling and we need more people yeah. like billy uh, involved in wrestling but man i just an nwa thing i just don't man i just feel like that's barking up an old dead tree yeah. this is how i feel about it i mean i and i'm a nostalgia guy and i love nwa but that actual business plan I just don't see it yeah. so anyways let's continue moving forward I think that's oh sexy right? star what yeah. were you going to say uh, about sexy star uh that we were, we're moving forward she so sexy stripped. star yeah. got stripped of the of the, of the the title because of the incident that happened at triple mania with uh um, with rosemary, rosemary which yeah. ended up causing a lot of drama between uh GFW and uh the the, the triple A people. So uh, basically, essentially, Rosemary, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Sexy Star has not yet apologized for what she did with the uh, the arm bar. Basically, she purposely broke Rosemary's arm, but she's saying that no, that that's not the way that it happened, that she was just doing her arm bar like she normally does, but yet she kept it going after the match was over. And essentially, she says that uh, Rosemary was never checked by any officials. And so she's trying to cover herself, but there's a right. bad rep. Well, what's the real, okay, like, sift through all the bullshit. What's the real injury that, that Rosemary has? She popped her arm out of socket, and they put it back in. And she's I think okay she popped now? her shoulder out, and they put it she's back in. She's okay now? Yeah. Okay. It is bullshit what, what Sexy Star did. And I, I, I've commented on this on other shows or whatnot. Um, she got her ass beat. She got her ass handed to her when she first started. I was there. She was what they... She was considered like a groupie or a wrestling fan, mm -hmm. you know, that got into wrestling. So those girls were beating her ass. So I guess maybe she felt like that, like, you know, that mentality is kind of carried over with her. Like, you don't have to be the one that, that passes it on mm -hmm. just because it happened to you, you know? Like, that goes with a lot of things in life, you know? To go so many years, though, without... Because she's been Sexy Star for a, a long, long time, time now. Yeah. That's, but there's been many years since that happened. And, and to go th so many years without an incident, and then to quit wrestling, to go into boxing, have her boxing match, then have this huge shadowy thing for her to come back and make a huge splash so they had to get the the, the title off of Taya because yeah. they didn't trust Taya to drop it so Sexy Star pulls this power play to come back in after she's retired and then in like one of her first matches back she does this like yeah that's brutal that's just but, but I mean but people are reading a lot of things into different things okay and they're, and I think they're not taking into consideration that wrestling in Mexico is still kayfabe Okay, I mean, they might get news from the states, but in Mexico, the business itself, everyone in the business, still treats it gay fabe. Okay, so her public statements, you can't look at those like you would a statement from a wrestler here, sure. because they're still half-assed trying to 
protect their business, okay? And even even then, like if you read Sexy Star's latest uh, statement she made, um, like she still she gives away some wrestling, like she gives away the business a little bit. And I think honestly, that's why she got uh, in trouble. Mm-hmm. I think she get heat for that. Yeah, I think a lot of people they've you know throughout her career they've already had like sh- they've already struggled with her whether she acts like a diva or she's just not doing what you know she's probably just maybe thinking more of herself. I know these are some of the rumors that are going around of people that have worked with her. So I know that in the in uh, in Triple Mania when she was in the four way she wasn't even necessarily pissed at Rosemary. She was mad at the other two girls because apparently they were stiffing her and, and she then couldn't she took do her shit about it. it on yeah. she, yeah. she yeah. tried to get physical with the other Next one and pump- it just was. Wasn't no, they all whip her ass. Yeah, because yeah, at one point she even came out of the match and was just like throwing a fit yeah. outside, and I was like, "Is this part of it? Like, what's <laughs> happening here?" It was crazy. Yeah, so you know, it's really like for us to sit back here in the states and 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 analyze it is it's difficult. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 there's a lot of cultural differences. Yes, but I think that what compounds it is that no one else who is in that match is part of that culture. Yeah. And especially not Rosemary, who wasn't even involved in what got Sexy Star hot, yeah. but ended up being the person who was at risk because of what Sexy Star yeah. decided to do. Yeah, And this is, I mean, it's really, honestly, I'm just telling you, knowing AAA, they could give two shits about okay. this. And it's not a big deal in Mexico in general. I don't, only because... It's being a big, uh, you know, being made a big deal out of internationally. That's that shit happens in Mexico between Mexican talent all the time. All right. So I mean, that's just how it is. I mean, it's right or wrong. It's it is wrong, you know. But I mean, it just still a little behind down there. Uh, yeah, I think that the 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 fact that happened on uh, Triple Mania is also why it's a big deal because like that's the one Triple A event. A year that people outside of AAA fans might yeah. watch, and happen yeah. there. Well, wasn't Jeff Jarrett supposed to address this on Global Force this week? Well, he's, there was like a teaser. Yeah, there was yeah, like yeah. a teaser I for just... them addressing it, and everyone's like, "If this was a work this entire time, that's so messed up and disgusting. How could they do that?" Yeah, I think he's just going to talk about it because Rosemary was involved. So I just think it's not a good idea to, to be putting a lot of focus on this. Like, oh, somebody really got hurt. You mean sure. so no one really get like. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, like, yeah. just that's just leave that's, it alone. That's the problem at the root of as good as the Roman Reigns John Cena stuff has been, like that whole like stuff that the NWO pioneered of like, this is the only real thing, and we know that you know that everything else isn't real, but this one is. Like, that doesn't really work at the end of the day. Like, it's bad for overall business. I feel. I think it's yeah. the reason why it's so high, why everyone's talking about it. So many little things. One, these two women are from, you know, different companies, different countries, whatever. And not only that, like, I know it sounds kind of bad, but they're women, too. So they're like, oh, like, you know, like, if these girls are get, having this kind of problems. Like, it's yeah. intriguing to people. And not only that, a Sexy Star's husband is super, you know, famous in Who Mexico. He's a, he's a famous boxer. He's, like, really huge in Mexico. I don't, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but he's... It's not con- but he's really huge like he's huge down there yeah, so okay. I think that's why you know it's also you know the, the intrigue is there and... yeah Johnny okay. Gonzalez yeah. alright well that's about it for the news this week hey let's before we uh, take a break and come back with uh, Marty Skrull let's uh, let's do our uh, our stuff Around that we the need horns? to do here yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you can follow us on AfterBuzz uh, TV, also Twitter, the real Xbox, uh, IG Xbox One Two Three Sixty, uh, Facebook Xbox One Two Three Sixty Show. Um, also, you can sign up for the newsletter on Facebook. Um, iTunes, definitely leave all your comments there, and definitely five stars. YouTube, we all read your comments, so please keep those comments going. And uh, celeb video. Uh, you want to say something uh, that happened last week? You said, or something? no? I just, <laughs> yeah, I just didn't get a chance to plug anything because I, I took, I abruptly took the show home <laughs> last week without letting anyone plug their social media or, or anything. It was just like slamming the car in the park when you're driving down the road doing 50. All right. So, yeah, no, celeb, celebvm.com slash Sean Waltman. So if you have like a wedding or. Uh, the wedding seem to be popular uh, lately with these. 
uh, bar mitzvah. Bar, yeah, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Any kind of uh, uh, anything, really. Yeah. yeah. We I, bring you the show every week for free, so uh, stop by celebvm.com slash Sean Waltman and buy a video. Support the show. Yes. Or if you want to stop by Bar Wrestling tomorrow in Baldwin Park, you could see Sean wrestle. And you could buy something from him personally. Uh, Shh, tickets. That's a secret. <laughs> no, uh, tickets are available at uh, brownpapertickets.com. Uh, 20 bucks if you buy them from there, 25 at the door. Also, Sean has a training seminar coming up at the Minnesota Wrestling Academy on October 30th. Uh, check out the Academy of Pro Wrestling.com for that. That'll be Sean Devare and Ken Anderson School. That so, year. also that week, like um, that Saturday. I have a an appearance in Eden Prairie at a place called Fan HQ, and uh, um, that's oh crap I don't know but anyways you can look that up uh, and and also uh, on, on Sunday there's a heavy on wrestling event in Duluth Minnesota uh, that Sunday which which is what the 29th yeah because that's the 30th yeah so that and that and so me returning to my home. One of my home states. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways, keep on going, Jimbo. That those are your upcoming events, and I just want to thank all the fans for sticking with us a whole year on Xbox One Two Three Sixty, constantly tweeting and tagging us and letting us know their thoughts. New fans, old fans, we really appreciate you. Continue to use the hashtag Xbox One Two Three Sixty and let us know what you like and who you want to see. You saw a lot of fans this weekend at PWG that had nothing but good things to say. I yes. talked to several people. Yeah. I, okay. You know, here and there we get like comments and you know going to airports or different things like that. Uh, people come, hey, love the podcast, but really a lot lately. Probably in the last I don't know couple of weeks, it's been like the awareness has gotten like oh, big. It's gotten big, yeah. And and um, I think that's just uh, what happens if you know we really just I mean fun, we just do our best to, to put on the best put out the best content we can yeah you know i'm pretty proud of everything and uh um trying to make it better so awesome yeah and pro wrestling tees.com slash sean waltman yep. all right so anyways anything else before we uh take uh, a break jimbo social media as well and oh. oh follow me on, on twitter at jimbo in the booth <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right and you guys can follow me on twitter and on instagram <laughs> at underscore denise salcedo all right so you guys don't get to plug your stuff at the end now <laughs> oh we were yeah. not uh, too late all right hey everyone we'll be right back uh with marty squirrel What's up, party people? Uh, Roxas Dreyer yeah. here from The Tomorrow Show with Kevin Undergaro. We're your twice-weekly broadcast of One Man's Midlife Crisis and the mad millennials in Star Trek uniforms that follow him. And I'm one of those millennials, Lauren Legrasso here. We've had some amazing guests like Russell Simmons, Ileana Douglas, and Craig Gass. Coolio, right? Christian Blatt in the house to tell you to go to thetomorrowshow.com to check us out. We're live every Monday and Thursday from 10 to midnight Eastern. That's thetomorrowshow.com. Be there, be square, whatever that means. Welcome back to X Pac One Two Three Sixty, everyone. Joining us now uh, from the UK, and he was uh, he was uh, this week he was in uh, the PWG Battle of Los Angeles, twenty seventeen. Um, ROH, I think he's still the ROH TV champion. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm uh, unfortunately not. <laughs> well, sh damn it. Anyways, there goes my introduction. So uh, hey, I'm a huge fan of this guy. You just heard his voice a little bit ago. They call him the villain. His name's Marty Skrull. Everyone give it up for Marty. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Now I, I can confirm, unfortunately, uh, I'm not the TV champion anymore. I want Adam Cole screwing me at the title. So, uh, no, I am Marty Nobel, as it goes at the moment. <laughs> That's all right. It's just another prop. You, you got plenty of them, man. Yeah. Like, I was watching. Well, well, I. Go ahead, man. Sorry. I was going to say, uh, it seems like in this day and age, like every one of my wrestler friends has like two or three or four belts. So right. In my head, I was like, right, I'm going to stand out. I'm going to lose all my belts. Marty Nobel. <laughs> so, it was the plan all along. Yeah, but you're, you know what, though? You have you have some of the sweetest gear and uh, just overall like your getup uh, of anyone in, like in wrestling, especially the independence uh, scene right now. So it's not like you really need the belt. 
Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Like, uh, to be honest with you, yeah, the amount of gimmicks I come with to the ring was getting a bit overwhelming, traveling with them all. So, uh, yeah, adding a belt in my bag was kind of a useless anyway. <laughs> 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 like, I always say it's a, it's a rib on myself because when I actually wrestle, all I wear is a little pair of, you know, trunks. But right. then when I pack to travel, I've got to take the coat, the umbrella, the hat, uh, the mask, everything. So it just ends up being a, you know, Half my bag is just my, is my entrance gear, so. Hey, Marty, um, when did we first meet? Was it on Southside, uh, Southside Wrestling Show? Yeah, I might have met you briefly before then. I'm trying to think. The first time I can really remember, though, was, was the Southside Show. In, uh, was that at in Circus India. Tavern? Yeah, which ironically, actually... So the place I trained to wrestle is actually just around the corner from there, like, literally, like, a like a minute walk away and it's a really kind of obscure area and I remember training when I trained there many years ago I remember thinking oh this is a really random place and kind of out of nowhere right. and then when I heard Southside running a show next to it I was like well this is bizarre so yeah I know that area quite well I spent kind of my teenage years around that, around that way learning how to wrestle huh. but th the thing is is I wouldn't have, if I met you uh before you were the villain, I wouldn't have recognized you uh, when I met you as the villain because I saw a picture of you, Marty, and you were holding up a belt. I think it was on your Wikipedia page, and I was like, "That can't be him." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can confirm. <laughs> I mean, no, you, you I, look uh, great, but yeah. you just don't look like you do now. No, no. I well, you know, I think. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are aware of me and uh, my my work as a wrestler as the villain yeah. um but it's only been doing that for maybe three or four years right but i actually realized earlier today i think it's been since i walked into a training school the one right near the circus tavern i think i've been involved now about 14 years so a long time kind of half oh yeah nearly half my life so um but no i've been wrestling for a long time but i never really had much i was so concentrating all the time on just being a good wrestler right. and you know knowing all the holes learning all the moves and then it kind of hit me one day I was like no Marty you need a gimmick and what you're doing is not working so I kind of had a transformation and uh, yeah that's what you got now <laughs> but yeah. no it was very, very different back in the day yeah well I mean I, I think it's working out pretty well for you don't you Marty uh, it seems to be going okay yeah, yeah you think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's good. It's certainly better than back then. But the, you know, it's a, it's a growing thing. Like when I started out um, back in the day, around 2004, 2005, the scene here in the UK wasn't so strong either. Yeah. So it obviously took all that experience and wrestling different people, you know, like yourself and everything else, to get better. So uh, I kind of grew as a performer, I guess, as the scene in the UK grew as well. Yeah. Hey, Marty, I was listening to you on Sam Roberts, and you were talking about how. Uh, how uh, you liked me when when you were younger, and that you that you really dug my uh, my, my SummerSlam '99 or no 2000, I think it was <laughs> match with uh, Kane versus Undertaker and Big Show. You were into that whole storyline, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like, uh, so I was a big fan of Xbox when I was a kid. Just the Archie in general. I'm honored um, by that, by the way. Thank you. No, it's yeah. You know, I've told you multiple times, but I'd watched. I used to watch uh, wrestling sort of in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, I was really young, you know, sort of five, six years old. And then I took like a little bit of a gap, maybe a few years where I wasn't able to watch it. And then I came back during the Attitude Era, which I think a lot of fans, if you look at the ratings, everything else is kind of what happened to the majority of people. Um, but then when I saw the Attitude Era, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it at first. I was like, what the hell is, like, what is this? This is just nuts. And I remember seeing Steve Austin beating up referees and thinking like you can't do that like and I, I thought he was a bad guy in my head I, was, I don't yeah. like him like, he's beating up the officials but uh, for some reason I really really took the DX I was a big you know I guess a lot of people my age was a massive sort of uh, DX mark and x Buck, uh for one reason or another was you know was my favourite and I, I'm guessing it's because I was always kind of told as a kid oh you're too small for this and too small for that so yeah. I looked at x Buck and I can kind of you know I kind of related to him a lot and uh, the whole dynamic of Kane, I know me and Zach were talking about the other day, we're like, yeah, Xbox and Kane are our favorite tag team. And uh, I don't know, I think it was just uh, the idea of a small guy with a big guy. Uh, and I remember that specific match. The reason why that match stands out for me, not necessarily the match, but I just remember going into that pay-per-view being like, oh, man, it's like, I believe yourself and Kane 
were the tag team champions. And yeah, we were. Him, Big Show and yep. The Undertaker. Yeah. And I was like, oh, mate. I was like, there is oh, there's no time to get to beat Undertaker and Big Show. Like, really, really concerned about it. You know? And you were so, right. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. Like, it got me at work now. I was like, oh, this, this is too big. I was like, Kane's big, but Kane's Xbox are not that, you know, big enough. Oh, you know, I was just really worried about it. And sure enough, you guys lost and broke my heart. So, uh, yeah, but, but, <laughs> but, but Marty, if you, if you look at that match, it's a, it's a, I think it's a great example of, of how a guy our size can can fit can fit in the mix with the bigger guys, you know, like because yeah. I mean I mean, yeah. looking at the just the way the match was set up, it, and I just think that was my strong suit. You know, I wasn't the most athletic. I had some really nice kicks, and you know, I took punishment and bump, good bumps and all that. But like. Uh, where was I? I just had the biggest brain fart ever in the middle of my <laughs> the match with Kane and Big Show. Your your technical, how your physical, I don't know. Yeah, damn. It. I think I get, you, you took like go on, go on next part. Like I feel like uh, you were one of those wrestlers that, despite your size, you kind of carried yourself like yeah. uh, where when you wrestled someone like the Big Show, you didn't look like our place. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, and 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 not Just, doing not doing things that take you out of your suspension of disbelief, you know, like like right, like yeah. when like when we like when you and I try to shoot a guy into the ropes that's three hundred and fifty pounds, it just doesn't look right, Marty, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm and, with and you. there's yeah. other and there's yeah. other ways of, of of going about getting people to move around the ring, and that's and and it was just that yeah. was that was my specialty, so that was what I was getting no, at. I agree I, with you. Yeah, I wasn't the bad. I wasn't the you know, wasn't the most athletic, but I was really good at that. So, yeah, no, <laughs> and, I'm and you are too. Yeah, I'm with you there. Like, I often think sometimes I'll be matched up with guys and I'll look at them and think, bloody hell, like, they're a lot taller than me. Yeah. But then I think the biggest compliment is when I have a match with someone and I ask someone afterwards in my car, did I look like really, really small next to them? And I'll say, no, no, you look fine. And I think it's just like that way of carrying yourself in the ring where you don't look completely out of place, if that makes sense. Yeah. And and as a um, a Marty, do you work as, as a villain? Do you work much with with bigger guys, or do, do when you're when you're uh, when you're booked out places, is everyone pretty much around the same size as you? Um, that's a good question. For the most part, it seems these days it's it's normally a lot of the same kind of size people as me. Obviously, when I'm in Japan, it's of the junior weights for the most part. Right. Um, but then you know, every now and then, like I actually enjoy working big guys because it's just another dynamic. Yeah. to tell and a different story to tell and you know you have to kind of switch up your moveset set and everything else but for the most part uh it's mainly guys my size yeah yeah it just, seems like i guess the general consensus of wrestlers these days is a lot smaller sure yeah and especially in the uk i noticed like because like there's there's a couple of guys over there like sticks was one of them uh he's not really working yeah. anymore but there was a couple of guys that here would just be considered you know like bigger guys but not huge you know um yeah no i think like I'm, I'm not sure why that is like i guess americans in general are bigger than europeans i find i guess it's to do you know you do you do sports at a serious level in school and everything else and i guess you know right. you, yeah, that's i don't know if it's that americans are more happy so what but in general it seems like you know you're bigger over there yeah so but you know when, when i was talking to you about the uh the size difference and working with bigger guys like as a heel uh marty like it's you don't get that David and Goliath uh, dynamic because you're the one that's got to be chop, you know, uh, getting the heat on the guy. And so, like it's it's tough, man. It's tough, but it's totally doable. Yeah, no, I think it's doable. I think a big part of it as well is just having to. I, I, I normally try and play it where I'm, you know, either dodging or diving or using underhand tactics right. or whatever it might be to try and go up and top. And also, like with me as well, I'll really try and turn the aggression up and I normally say to the guy before like remember years ago I can't even remember who it was but I was just in someone who was big I can't even remember but I was hitting them and they're like and I'm just you know giving them some work punches whatever it was or uppercuts or forearms and they're like dude just hit me like you're not going to hurt me just hit me <laughs> and went from, you know trying to work it just hitting them as hard as I can I've kind of kept that <laughs> yeah. as I've gone on so anytime I go on a big guy I normally say before I'm like oh Heads up, I apologize. Um, but then obviously, like I said, it, whether it's dodging and diving or just using those underhand tactics, I think the payoff is normally, you know, you bumping your ass off at, you know, towards the end. So, sure. uh, you know, that's, that's another thing with big guys, like getting thrown around. 
Hey, Marty, um, how'd you feel this weekend at, at uh, Battle of Los Angeles? Uh, it was good, really good. I uh, the temperature there. You were there yourself. Oh yeah. Was just utterly ridiculous. <laughs> so I must, you know, say, say good job to the fans because they sit there for you know the shows. Like you've been there, they're long shows, and the fans yes. sit there the whole time. And the first night, I I'd been out in the daytime uh, by a pool, kind of with my top off, and I think I've got a bit of sort of sunburn, a bit of sunstroke. I just felt absolutely horrendous and just before my match and really really struggling to breathe but no i wrestled uh flash morgan webster on the first night and um and it was i think that was actually his debut in america actually so i was you know i was hoping to have a good match with him to try and that's the thing now like i've, I've got my place at pwg now a good relationship with uh super dragon owns it and everything else um so there's obviously quite a few guys coming over making their debuts Flash Morgan Webster was one of them. He's been around the UKC now for quite a number of years, so it was more important for me that first night to try and make him stand out and, you know, kind and, of guarantee him the job at PWG. And you really did that, Marty. I mean, you really featured him. And the way you started the match off was absolutely brilliant because I believe there was probably <laughs> there was two matches before you, right? Either one or two matches, and you know damn well from the first match on, everyone's going out there and throwing everything they've got out there to uh yeah, yeah. to impress everyone uh in the wrestling world and especially dave Meltzer sitting in the front row uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. so w what yeah, impressed well, me more than anything was the way you started that match marty yeah yeah well i uh the way i look at bwg i i really enjoy the shows and it's not necessarily because the crowd's so wild or you know the, or the standard of wrestling. It's just I always look at it as a challenge because, like I said, you've got so many guys going out there doing everything and throwing against the wall. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, I can't do that. Like, I haven't got that many impressive moves. I'm not like a crazy high flyer. I'm not going to be taking any massive bumps to the floor anytime soon. Like, I want to have a long career. <laughs> so, <laughs> in my head, I'm always like, okay, how can I just try and do something different? Or, more so lately, just I'm like, oh, how can I just tell a good story? Because a lot of these matches, uh, on the show, it's not that you don't have a, a, a good story, but a lot of them don't have a good they're story. Really, really heavily <laughs> emphasized. Yeah, they just, you know, they're more just based on the moves and yeah. the oohs and the ahs. And a lot of the guys are working for pops, you know, that kind That's of right. firework display, which is fine. So then I'm like, okay, cool. How can I try and uh, work for heat as opposed to, yeah. to pops? And it got to a point in PWG quite early on for me where. I was, even though I came in as a bad guy, I was getting really, really, you know, decent reactions and like almost like baby face reactions. Um, and then it would be easy for me just to kind of ride that and be like, okay, I guess I'm a, a baby face here now. But in my head, I was like, no, you know what? I want to challenge. So now it's like, come out, I get a really good reaction. I'm like, right, how can I turn the crowd against me straight away? Do you know what I mean? Like, how can yeah. I get them to not enjoy me? And that's the challenge for me. And that's what I want to do. I know for a fact if I go to the ring, and I do a pile driver on the apron or whatnot, it's going to get a response. But, you know, where's, what's the, how am I getting any kind of creative satisfaction from that? You know, so yeah. it's more important for me now to go out there and try and do something different and maybe do something that's a bit of a risk. And I honestly, if you ever call a match with me, I'll sort of time I say, okay, this, I want to try this. There's a good chance it might get crickets and it might not get over, <laughs> but we'll give it a go. And if it, you know, Nine times out of ten, it's all right because of you know, um, you know, kind of a good idea what the, what the audience wants. But there is sometimes when I do something, it's like, oh, that didn't work. Um, but I, that's the, the risk I want to take as a performer. Uh, so yeah, the match I did with um, uh, with Flash of the weekend, uh, we started the match and I kind of got in the microphone and chewed him out and said, listen, I'm the I'm the Battle of Sanders winner and this is my place and. You know, save yourself the embarrassment. You can leave now and go back to Wales. And the um, people are, and the people are free. eating it all up. The people are eating it all up. Every yeah. every word you were saying, they're well, eating it up. But the thing is, as well, yeah, for sure. And the thing was, I was like, Flash, he's he's you know a, an exciting baby face, but no one knew him. So I was like, okay, there's a real good chance if I just go in this straight, like the people might just gobble him up and just cheer me. Yes. And kind of not go. It was really important for me to get on him kind of interrogate him and maybe think, oh, you know what? He's been an arsehole. This guy has flown all the way from Wales. Like, we want to cheer for him. So yeah. I said to him, you know, I'll give you the count of three to get out of my ring. And then uh, as I started to count, he um, headbutted me 
and uh, covered me for the one, two, three. Wasn't uh, it? Well, to what the fans thought was <laughs> for the one, two, three, you know, beating the bowler champion within, you know, 10 seconds, whatever it is, in yeah. the first round. But they didn't realize that my foot was under the bottom rope. So was it sure really, though? See, because I think you put my... it on after the fact, Marty. <laughs> I, I said, was Jordan it was really? Because I think you put your foot on the rope after the three count. Oh, no, I didn't put my foot on the rope at all. My foot was underneath. Ah, that's what it was. No, but, okay, so yeah. when, when that happened, when he had butted you, because it was like the, you were counting and the people were counting with you, one, two, or something, and, and then, then, bam, you heard this smack and he had butt you. Down you go, covers you, one, two, three. The the roof about blew yeah, off of that place, man. And and I'm sitting I'm, and I'm standing next to Brian Kendrick, and we're watching through the curtain. You know that you know it's really hard to watch, but we're and and we don't you know because we can't see your foot on underneath the rope. And we thought that was it. Oh, okay. We thought that was it, and we yeah. thought it was, and and we thought if that was it, it was great. Just at that. You know what? I I kind of wish it was it. <laughs> it was well. I don't obviously I want to advance, but. Uh, if it was flash advancing, it would have been a great way. But no, my foot was actually under the ring. It was like it was, my foot was actually out of the uh, yeah. completely out of the ring. They're quite straight opens there. But I think a lot of people were, were either like, I guess they'll notice more when they watch the DVD and it's got commentary. But I think people are like, oh, he didn't kick out or his foot wasn't yeah. right. Like, no, no, that's right. Neither of them was the case. My foot was under the ring. So the referee cut one, two, three, and realized as, as he was doing the three, the, the leg was under the ring. So it saved me from being eliminated straight away. But, uh, no, again, and again, that was, uh, like you said, it managed to get probably one of the, the biggest pops of the night and one of the biggest reactions. Um, yeah. And obviously what I'm doing is kind of move, moving my legs slightly as opposed to being power drive on the apron. Yeah, and <laughs> so, see, here's the I'm thing, Marty. Here's the thing about that. Like, if, you know, you were saying if you would have went out there and just gobbled him in, in the beginning, like, you know, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have served him well. If you would have went out there right. and then and just shined him up big time that wouldn't have served him well either i don't think right it, it, it was that it was that what you did in the beginning that set the stage for for his uh for a successful debut for him that was a real big solid you did for him yeah well, i appreciate that thank you like i said it's just like, again for me he's just trying to go in there and be like especially because i wrestle there a lot i'm always like oh what can i do different this time yeah. i mean because i'm going to change anytime soon um but i'm like oh what can i what can i do you know Sure. Hey, hey, um, my uh, my compadres here want to hop in. Who wants to, who wants to hop in Please first? Do. Well, Marty, uh, both of the guys that you wrestled at Bola this weekend, you know, both are from the UK scene, as you mentioned. How is how does it feel like for you to be a measuring stick guy? Uh, yeah, it's kind of odd. It's, it's funny how uh, I mean, because I, I mean, I wrestle in the United States uh, the majority of the time now, but I still live in the UK and spent you know the majority of my career here. And so the two guys I know really well. So it is quite ironic flying, especially for them. They must think, oh, flying 11, 11 hours to California to wrestle Marty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who lives a few hours from my house. But uh, no, I think I think they were both uh, excited to go in there with me because, again, they know I'm not a, a selfish wrestler and I'm someone who, uh, you know, can, can have good matches and enjoy people. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to think that, like, you know, I'm one of the guys that have helped the UK uh, wrestlers kind of spread out across, you know, across the world and break out, should I say. Uh, back in the day, it seemed like such a hard obstacle to, you know, to even to wrestle in WF or you know, even wrestle in America seemed like such a big thing. And back in the day, we really had was the Bulldog. And later on, it was guys like Steve Regal. And then a little later on, guys like Doug Williams, and Johnny Storm, Johnny Fleisch, the kind of the class feeling. But then for many years, it didn't seem like uh, that was a real realistic opportunity for us. So I feel like my you know, guys like myself and, and Zach Sabre Jr., we kind of broke that glass ceiling for guys. And now, you know, the UK seems on fire. So these guys are getting, you know, opportunities and chances to do this. So uh, no, I was happy to be a part of um, them. And plus, like, like I said, I've wrestled a BWG so much now. Like, I've pretty much gone through the roster. So I need these new guys to, to wrestle with. Well, you won bola last year 2016 was that the original plan or was chris hero supposed to win and then he got injured and they decided to give it to you oh mate i cannot confirm i just won i, I, I flew all the way out there and uh no i powered through and i won the whole thing <laughs> was that the first time you went you met william regal 
backstage at PWG? Uh, possibly. Cause I'm not uh, sure. I've met him a handful of times. I know you're hitting the high spots with Rob Naylor in 2015. It was Bola weekend, and you said you hadn't met Regal because they were talking about Regal. And then 2016, he was uh, there. Okay. There's this great picture of you and him backstage talking. What kind of advice did he give yeah. you? And what's it like to have him in the locker room? So, Big was great. Um, like, I don't really have much relationship with him, but I'm, I actually spoke to him quite a bit this weekend. Um, but again, he's just a great, you know, person to kind of brain pick. I'll do the same when I see Sean as well. But um, what's great about Regal as well is, I guess, I'm in very similar uh, kind of footsteps as, as he was many years ago. You know, being a British guy trying to yeah. make his mark on the US scene or whether it be Japan and just trying to be unique and different. So, no, Regal, he'll, he'll watch matches and he'll never really... I'll ask him for advice afterwards and he'll never really talk to me about my match. It'll be normally other stuff. It'll normally be kind of character stuff or advice on, on how to, you know, conduct myself in the ring or whatever. It's never normally... Normally I'm like, oh, what do you think of the match? And it's, you know, if the crowd's gone with it, it's like, yeah, the match is great. But yeah. maybe you can do this. I mean, it, again, it's never normally about the matches. So, no, Regal's... Uh, he's been a good help. Like, I must admit, maybe four or five times now so um, I'll always try you know anytime as a veteran or anyone I respect I'll always try and you know bother them and try and pick their brains Regal's a detail guy when he, he like his advice and stuff like uh, I heard him pull uh, uh, Flash Morgan aside like after your match and tell him just something simple as this when he was getting a near fall on you Marty and the ref would count one two yeah. and you'd kick out and every time you would kick out uh, Flash would look up at the ref and go two count, you know, hold the two fingers up and, and, and Regal yeah, was just yeah. telling him, look, as a baby face they like you, which is really rare for, for for people to take to a baby face that quick anyways and he was just telling him little yeah. things like that, they're not a big deal but all those little things like that, like a baby face wouldn't necessarily do that, you know I mean, it's little things like that that yeah. Regal brings to the table Such Yeah, no, you, you can be right and uh yeah, it's often stuff I, you know, I've learned over the years, and now I try to, to speak to people. Like, I'll see matches where, especially in the UK, because of the amount of holiday cap shows have been here over the years, you'll see so many matches where the baby face is so uh, happy, clappy, and wanting to yeah. get the fans behind them, so they'll start trying to cheer the crowd up. But there's a lot of times I find over here, not so much more, but used to be so overbearing, people like, come on, cheer for me, cheer for me. Oh, and Chief J Strongbow. Chief, <laughs> Chief J Strongbow. When I went out to the ring one time and did that shit, Marty, um, you know yeah. the whole clap, get everyone going. I came back. He he he, he used to call me Trailer. He goes, a Trailer. I said, what, Chief? He goes, why don't you just bring a, a pair of pom bom pom poms out to the ring with you next time? <laughs> well, that's it. Like, yeah, cheerleading in the ring, I guess. Yeah. So, I guess, I guess the thing is, is like, you know, everything you're doing in the ring is supposed to tell that story of what character you are and make you either likable or dislikable. And I guess standing there going, come on, everyone, please cheer for me. Yeah. is actually not really that likable. <laughs> yeah, and you're sticking, you're sticking to your uh, to your heel guns, like you were saying earlier. Like, you're not giving up on it and just going with the baby face thing. Like, because uh, it is likable, Marty. Like, and, and, and the more you heal on people, like... Do you remember that? Remember it at PWG uh, the third night when uh, I can't remember what you were doing, uh, but you were walking outside the ring in the middle of the match, and the guy like tried to give you a high five, and you went up for it, and then like flipped him off. A little shit like that. Yeah, sure. loved it. I love the fact that a fan was heckling you in the crowd, and you threw your opponent onto him. Yeah, <laughs> that got a huge that was pop. Great. And then hey, the next night you went to do it was, again, and the fan got out of his chair and was like, "No, no, it was just <laughs> awesome." Yeah, well, it's just that, that I guess that fun crowd interaction. That's what people want, especially in such a small little like in, you know intermediate building. People want that; they want to be engaged. So there's you know, let's say Peter G, there's maybe only 400 people there. So like, you know, in the course of a match, I can probably engage with a lot of different people, and obviously, some of them it might be just a little catch of the eye a little sort of snig but then obviously there's the other extreme where they get my opponent in front on top of them as well yeah. <laughs> either way I like to try and involve the audience as part of my kind of performance uh, while we're talking about crowd interaction and crowd reaction uh, when you went to New Japan uh, I wanted you to succeed I'm a fan of Marty Skrull but I was honestly oh, very surprised at 
how quickly you got so over with the New Japan crowd. And, and do, you, do you have any explanation for, for your how, how rapidly you were able to be embraced by that fan base? Um, I mean, I was very fortunate in the sense that so the the matches I presume you would have seen where the crowd reacted really well to me would have been in the, the bigger kind of cities like or the bigger venues with the smarter crowds, places like Kirkland Hall or maybe Osaka. But trust me, there was we did a lot of country towns where <laughs> I walked out and no one had a clue who I was and it was legit crickets. <laughs> that was certainly a case. <laughs> no, uh, the, I was fortunate because the first night I debuted, it was live on New Japan World, uh, but it was in Crooken Hall. And I guess it's just, uh, uh, you know, I guess now the, the fans are just smart because of social media and things like, you know, these apps where you can watch Ring of Honor or whatever, or PWG, whatever it might be. Uh, I guess people had even been watching it or they'd heard that I was announced for the tournament and so they'd researched me already. Um, so I guess there's less pressure in that sense. Kind of like PWG this weekend. A few years back when I debuted at PWG, not too many people knew who I was, but in this weekend when like guys like Travis Banks and Flash Morgan Webster, I think a lot of the audience have kind of done their research leading up to it and, and obviously now it's such an easy time to do so. So yeah, I was lucky in that sense in Japan and... Uh, what, what I found really funny is, I guess, people assume that Japanese wrestling, especially New Japan, they expect it to be kind of no-nonsense, uh, strong style, everything else. But the crowd's actually if, you know, more, more so into the gaga. They, they like, love it. You know, the fact they come out to the ring with that big stuff. They love that stuff. Like, And I was like, God, I'm actually doing less stuff here in Japan than I would do in the States. Like, a lot less. Do you know yeah. what I mean? The crowd's they prefer this kind of stuff. So. Yeah, but yeah, they don't the, just the buy anybody's there. gaga. They don't just buy anybody's gaga. It's got to be good gaga, Marty. <laughs> well, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, no, I think for them, they just, again, going back to me, just trying to stand out and look different. I think like with my entrance and everything, they hadn't seen anything quite like it. And they were like, oh, who's this guy? And <laughs> I guess, you know, it kind of caught on amongst them. But um, no, they, they're into that kind of stuff. They liked all the, all the kind of character work and everything else. Yeah. That was my next question for you, actually, Marty, because we talked about your party Marty days. When I first got exposed to you, you were in that transitional period where you were still using the party Marty theme, but you had the fur coat and the umbrella, and you were beginning to be the villain. But I want to know, where did the Plague Doctor stuff come from? Because that's what people are really latching on to now. Yeah. Um, I uh, Some of the biggest shows I used to do in London, I used to try and organize kind of like a big entrance. You know, like at WrestleMania, the guys would have, yeah. you know, d different gimmicks for entrances. And uh, it was just an album cover I saw one day of this Plague Doctor, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I just, I was like, oh, it's this entrance. I'm going to dress up as a Plague Doctor. <laughs> and then uh, just completely out of nowhere. There uh, might like be said, some... I do a lot of stuff that's a risk. <laughs> there might be <laughs> like some people... There might be some people that aren't familiar with what Plague Doctor is. It's the, like the mask, the, the big, big bird, bird the mask, 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 and all that, right? Yes, I believe it was the, the, the doctors who'd used them back in the Black Plague and yeah. uh, where there's masks and they'd put kind of spice and stuff in the nose to kind of protect them from, right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just I was like, oh, I'm going to just sort of as a plague doctor. And then that was only supposed to be like a one-time thing, uh, did an entrance, and then people kept sending me, like people reacted to it and they kept sending it like fans. This, again, this while social media comes into play. Uh, a lot of fans would send me uh, you know, drawings of these, you know, me and the play doctor mask and kind of really pops for the play doctor mask. So I was like, oh, I guess. And then it, even then I went through a phase of just wearing it sometimes. And I was like, no, my, I think I need to wear this every time. So, <laughs> but you already, yeah, it just kind of, you already had the, you already had the umbrella in the act and then you added the plague doctor mask. Yes. Yes. I'm just one by one adding different <laughs> gimmicks. Like eventually I'm going to have like a, a monkey on my shoulder and come to the ring with a motorbike. <laughs> Still and the flames coming out of it. <laughs> Do it. Uh, my, my, my last question for you about new Japan is, uh, Mar uh, Zack Saber is in the G1. You wear you weigh the same as Zack yeah. Saber. When, when is Marty Skrull going to get a heavyweight shot in New, New Japan? Uh, well, I'm definitely. It's funny. Like when I was announced for the best of Super Juniors, loads of fans go, "Oh, Marty's not a junior weight." And I was like, "No, I definitely am a junior <laughs> weight. <laughs> I weigh about twelve and a half stone. It's like I don't know, 180 pounds." Um, so I, I think it's because. I spent so many years 
I don't really wrestle a cruiserweight style, and I spent seven years right. wrestling in promotions for like the heavyweight belt. So people, I guess, assume that I'm not a I'm not a junior weight, but I very much am a junior weight. Somehow, I don't know what's going on with Zach. Somehow, <laughs> he's in the heavyweight division. So because uh, he's no, six, because like, like to... he's like six one or something, right? Like, I mean, yes. I think maybe that's how he's they're. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a junior weight back in the day when he wrestled for Noah, and I guess it's just one of those things. I guess, like, you know, was sitting at the time, I suppose. But no, I like the idea of. You know, obviously, I've just started New Japan now, and there's, there's a, you know, a whole load of good junior weights. So it'd be nice to kind of wrestle in, in that division for you know however many years, and then maybe move up to heavyweight. So maybe I'd have to go for a bulking trade or something. But no, uh, no, we're very much a, a junior weight. Well, going back to your outfit and your fur coat and the umbrella and the hat and now the mask, when you fly to California from England, do they ever stop you at customs? Like, why are you bringing a fur coat and umbrella to L.A.? Has anyone ever given you shit about that? Uh, no, a few times I've had the whole, oh, you know, you're optimistic with your umbrella or what not. But uh, no, it'd be more like, I'd have it quite often when my bag would get pulled over and I'd be more worried about uh, like, oh, they're going to pull the mask out and I'm going to be, you know, wondering why the hell I've got this, you know, this mask, which could look like it's some kind of crazy gimp mask or something. Right. Uh, it was more so when I used to carry around the belt with me, I used to get stopped a lot because it's kind of, I don't have it in my hand luggage, you know, go through and uh, they'd stop me and pull the belt out and, you know, ask me silly questions and stuff but uh no for the most part uh, i'm all right actually tell actually coming back from lax not yesterday day before as i was going through because i always have my hand my umbrella with me because it won't fit in my, my you know my suitcase uh as i'm going through the security guard he must have recognized me he was like oh is that the is that the bullet club umbrella i'm like oh it's the very one he goes oh i watch being the elite all the time I'm like, nice. oh great she's weak <laughs> Do you ever worry about uh, bad luck opening umbrellas and doors? Uh, I used to. I used to be super, super uh, suspicious about it, but I kind of gave up after a while. <laughs> Ma- Marty, I realized that. God, no, I'm sorry. Do you uh, do you carry an extra umbrella in case the other one breaks, like happened in New Japan uh, at the G1 special? Uh, that would be smart, actually. I, don't often... <laughs> <laughs> I think when I was in Japan, I... When I was in Japan, I, uh, I, I think I took a few with me there because that was a tour and I'd get one on the bus. But I, uh, for the most part, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult now because I used to just have a normal umbrella. Yeah. So quite often on the road, it would get broken. I'd go, oh, I'm just going to find another umbrella. Uh, so now um, I have to have the, the Bullet Club umbrella, which is obviously a bit harder to get hold of, and I can't just walk into a shop and buy one. Yeah, but so you're... if you've noticed what... More so, my matches these days, the umbrella becomes less and less of a weapon because I'm gotcha. scared of breaking it. <laughs> you see, here's the thing: uh, you should be able to go to the to the merch stand and get your uh, your Bullet Club umbrella from there because they should be selling those to the uh, to the to the fans, Marty. You should be making money off. Well, of they those are umbrellas. now. They're, they're, they're selling them. They're selling them. Uh, they're, if you ring of honor now, um, they have the uh, the Bullet Club umbrellas. And I had to fight for that as well. I remember Good. Saying. I remember saying one of the days I was like, listen, because I, I think it was my T-shirts. We were doing a weekend in, I want to say Boston, and uh, like on the first show, two days in Boston, in the same venue. And before, it might have even been before the first show started, myself and my, my T-shirts and the Young Bucks T-shirts had all sold out. And I remember going to over to stand and being like, why are the shirts sold out? Like, you've got a truck. We need to be bringing loads of these shirts. Like, these are brand new. Like, they're going to sell. Right. And I was like, we need umbrellas here while we're at it. Do you know what I mean? Like, these are going to... Yeah, man. You know, they went online and they sold ridiculous amounts of them. And they crashed the Pro and Teeth and I was like, people want this. Like, we need it here. That's the reason why I'm carrying it to the ring. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. it's, uh, it's, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to push it somewhere. So, no, fortunately, Ring of Honor bought a big stock of them. So, you can buy them at, uh, at Ring of Honor shows. Often, I'll get fans asking me at independent shows if they can buy the umbrellas. Uh, but... You know, like I said, it's hard enough for me now just to travel with my entrance gear and my clothes and everything else to show. So, like, traveling to a show with 20 umbrellas would be a complete nightmare. So. No, that's why you have somebody else carry them. Speaking Anyways, of your shirts, <laughs> they're all for sale at Hot Topic. Maybe Hot Topic will carry your umbrellas. I heard you say in an interview, if your shirts did well at Hot Topic, they were going to give you Funko Pop Vinyl figures. Nice. Obviously, your shirts have well, done very well. Do you know if 
you're getting those pop vinyl figures? Uh, I've heard rumors. Nothing's confirmed yet, though, so I don't want to get anyone's hopes up. But, you know, it could be in the works as far as I know, but I've not been told anything official, so. Do you know who in the Bullet Club would get them? If it would just be uh, like you I and don't. the Bucks, or if it'd be I'd like... hope it'd be me. <laughs> but I'm not sure. No, the, like, as far as I know, like, um, the stuff of Hot Topic's been going really well. And, uh, you know, every week our T-shirts have been in the top five selling shirts there. And I think it's we've made it now, I guess, with Hot Topic in general would be a store where people wouldn't necessarily go there looking for something. They'd maybe just walk past and be like, oh, we'll check out Hot Topic and maybe pick up, I don't know, like a Metallica T-shirt or something. But now it's got to the point because, you know, we've, we have our shirts in there. We're promoting and pushing these shirts. And now it's actually sent our fans and customers, to, you know, to Hot Topic looking for the Bullet Club shirts. And I think it's a good case of, you know, people might go there and they're like, oh, I want a Villain Club shirt. And then if there's not a Villain Club one, they might be like, oh, I'll pick up, you know, the Young Bucks t-shirt or, you know, vice versa or whatnot. So, uh, no, it's been... I've been really overwhelmed, actually, with uh, our stuff going on Hot Topic because it was one of those things where I was like, oh, this could be, you know... It, again, like I said earlier, when you take a risk and, oh, it might get crickets, like, you might go in there and not sell anything. But, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the hey, setting's been really uh, overwhelming in Hot Topic. Listen, so. Marty, it does... Look... What, no matter how many they sell, your shirt is up on the wall at Hot Topic. So I, at the very yeah. least, it's up. You have a shirt at Hot Topic, and that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, but just still, yeah, I still, I guess I'm really processed it yet, really, because I remember when I first went to LA, like maybe two or three years ago, I remember going into Hot Topic and seeing WWE t-shirts on yeah. the wall. And my mind being blown then, being like, what? This shop selling wrestling shirts? Like, that's crazy. Yeah. You know I mean? hey, um, have you guys now, had any... Have you, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, man. Have you... Uh, sometimes I step on people on the show. I'm really sorry, Marty. Um, You're good. <laughs> uh, have, has anybody mentioned doing in-store appearances at Hot Topics around the country? Uh, there's not really been any talks of it yet. We did uh, walk to Hot Topic when we did Long Beach shows in yeah. Japan. We were like, there was a hot, there was a hot topic, maybe a five minute walk away. So, the majority of the Bullet Club, I think Cody was there, but myself, Box, and Kenny, and a few yeah. others, maybe Hangman Page, and Chase, we all just walked to the hot topic. And uh, it was quite funny because we were just walking there, and then within a few seconds, we had sort of Bullet Club fans following us. And then by the time we got there, we maybe had like 100 fans with us to try yeah. and walk into this store, this hot topic store. And then when we walked in there, they didn't have any Bullet Club shirts, like zero, they'd sold out. <laughs> so like, oh, okay. Uh, but no, it's not, uh, that's not been a thing, which is actually quite surprising. Uh, I think maybe next month, maybe even this month, I'm gonna uh, try and get over to the Hot Topic headquarters. Uh, I wanted to do it this weekend yeah. um, while I was over PWG, but our schedule was so busy with the shows and everything, I didn't get a chance to. So hopefully, maybe this month or next, when I'm next in Los Angeles, I'm going to try and get to headquarters and hopefully I'll be able to find out more. Uh, but no, I think that would be a good thing. Like I, I said to the, the boys a while ago, I said, like, there's a lot of um, clothing brands these days, especially like gym wear, clothing brands will do these pop-up shops and they'll just, you know, pop up a shop for a day in a big city and then sell all the stuff. I was like, we should go around the country doing a Bullet Club one, you know, like, like a Bullet Club meet and greet almost. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, it's certainly a possibility. But, yeah, maybe I'll talk to Hot Topic about it and see what I can do. <laughs> Please, do that for me, would you, Marty? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey. I will do, definitely. <laughs> hey, Marty, um, how'd, you, how'd you come up with your finish? How did you, uh, how did you decide you wanted to use a chicken wing for your finish? <laughs> um, well, it's funny because well, it's only to you reminded me you used to use a chicken wing in WCW. Yeah. Which, the buzz killer. I don't know if I, like, subconsciously stole that. <laughs> like, I don't know if that was a Well, thing. you wouldn't have been I stealing it because it, I didn't invent the damn thing, so. Well, no. No, it was just a case of, uh, yeah, so I never had a few different finishes back when I was a good guy. Um, nothing really stuck. And then it was a case of, okay, how can I... I was like, okay, I'm a bad guy now. I want to make a move. Like, what's the most... Almost like what was the most boring move I can think of? Well, not that boring, but like the least impressive. You know, it does, doesn't involve a flip, doesn't involve a big bump. Right. And uh, a lot of British guys used to use the uh, used to use the chicken wings. So guys like Marty Jones would use it, um, and Johnny Kidd, and uh, <laughs> even Norman Smiley would use it. I think in WCW as well. Yeah. So I just kind of thought, oh, you know, maybe uh, I always thought it was a cool move. 
and like I said, they did legit hold. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll put it on. And if I start winning all my matches with it, people are gonna be like, ah, oh, like it's just not an impressive move. And I just thought it'd be a really good way to to get eat and not get pops from my finishes. Uh, but ironically, kind of end up being one of the most popular parts of my hat. And yeah. People were actually quite excited to see it. So yeah, I guess I kind of backfired. And, <laughs> and and the other part and the other uh, like. The other thing you do that, like, I think people like amongst them, uh, uh, like right up there with that is, is when you do the finger break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, uh, a lot of my move set or the stuff I did, like the school that I got taught in was, um, the guys who ran it were all kind of old British wrestlers from back in the sort of seventies, um, from that kind of world sport era. So a lot of my training it was, you know, uh, was taught in that style. Then when I got into the scene, everyone was wrestling the American style. Um, so I always went back to my training to kind of get stuff that was, you know, would make me stand out now. And the American stuff, that, even if something so simple like breaking some fingers or something yeah. like a chicken wing, would stand, stand out because it was so simple and, and different. So uh, that, that was literally taught to me <laughs> years ago when I first started training. I was like, oh, that's cool. And uh, I used to do that. Like an idiot, I didn't even think about it. Like I used to do it like during the start of matches or just during like a like a chain wrestling sequence. Uh -huh. And then uh, <clears throat> I realized the, the kind of reaction it was getting. I was like, no, like I need to start doing that like as a cutoff or <laughs> you know like uh, to get my heat in a match. Yeah. And then as it again as it progressed, I was like, no, maybe it needs to be a bit later. And then it's actually when I wrestled AJ Styles for the first time, uh, I was like, yeah, maybe I'll do this here. And he goes, oh no, he goes, you need to do that really late in the match. Yeah. I was like, okay. And it was him that kind of got me, he used to have a thing where he'd hit a guy with a move, they'd be sitting on their ass, and he'd kind of give them the kind of bullet club uh, gun finger to the head. And yeah. I was like, he's like, yeah. It might have been his idea of mine, but it was either I was going to grab the finger and snap it. And then got such a great reaction to that. I was like, damn, like, I, I, right. like I need to be doing this at the very end of my matches. I found it interesting that you were telling me um, that Austin mentioned to you, maybe you should use that as one of your finishes. Yeah, he did. We actually had a few people saying that to me. So uh, obviously, you're going to take someone uh, like Austin's advice. And I and I, I and I totally understand why he told you that because I mean it is one of your signature moves and it gets a hell of a pop. And uh, so I mean I do get it. Yeah, no, I completely understand. And plus, you know, you don't want the guy to be wrestling, you know, the rest of the match with a broken finger either. So uh, <laughs> no, that normally comes out at the end of the matches now. But yeah, it's funny. It's, it's kind of weird how. Uh, Again, it's one of those things that I did and was noticing the reactions and then realized that, you know, my matches need to end while the match peaks, or yeah. the audience peaks. Yeah. And I uh, always found that was like, one of the, you know, one of my main uh, reactions from the crowd. So, yeah, it's, it's funny how people kind of know me for that move now. And I've seen like a lot of different wrestlers try and steal it and they don't manage to get the kind of same reaction because I feel like it's the way... You set it up in the way you do it, That's and right. I always try and do mine as like a. I always do mine as like a moment of desperation where you know I've used all the tools in my box, but like I've got nothing left, and all I can do, you know, all I can do is try and grab hold of the thing and try and break it. And even I don't really want to do it, but I've got to do it, try and win the match. And that's kind of how I gather the reaction rather than just doing it again, rather than just being a pop. Do you know what I mean? I try and you know create a story around it. Yeah. Whose idea was the little dance thing you do before you set up the chicken wing? <laughs> Oh, mate, honestly, I'm just an idiot. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I just, I mean, like, anything, I think I said this on Steve Austin's podcast, anything I do that people think is good or funny, I would have done in the first place, just me purposely messing around, just being an idiot. Uh, and I think a big part of it was in the UK, wrestling on a holiday camp, so we used to wrestle sometimes eight, ten times a week, and you do all these matches every day, sometimes twice a day, three times a day. I just used to start doing stuff in the matches to either, you know, pop myself or pop my opponent or whatnot. And then, uh, you know, just trying to be silly and funny. And sometimes stuff just kind of sticks around, I guess. So uh, that was kind of one of them as well. It started off with just a, a point, and, you know, a pose, and then it's kind of dramatically become what it is now. But again, it's probably one of the more highlighted things in my matches now. But yeah, everything I do is pretty much just a massive rib on myself. So. <laughs> nice. Did you ever think about renaming the chicken wing more to your character? Or you like keeping the original uh, name? 
No, no, a lot of people have asked me that, but no, I don't think so. Like, I like, you know, you know the move is a chicken wing, and I think that's a big part of why people enjoy it, because it's kind of like a silly name, like the chicken wing, but people think that's kind of funny, I guess. I don't know. No, I don't, no. To me, that, that's what the move is, so I don't, I don't need to call it, like, the villain curse or something silly. I, I think it's just as fine as it is. <laughs> Hey Marty, we're uh, we're coming up toward the end of the show, so we're gonna uh, I'm gonna let everyone kind of ask their uh, their final questions here. So go ahead, everyone. So speaking of the villain character, were there any villains that you studied in the world of wrestling or entertainment to kind of come up with any sort of these quirks for your character? Yeah, more less so in the wrestling, more so uh, from movies. Like not necessarily a villain, but. I really like uh, Jim Carrey in The Mask and really, really kind of infatuated with that character. So I tried to take different character traits from him and I guess obviously uh, Heath Ledger in The Joker was another another one. And even uh, Alex from uh, Clockwork Orange uh, wow. is a controversial character. But those those are the ones that are like, oh yeah, those, that's a badass character. Like I kind of want to be like that, you know? Nice. Go ahead, guys. Wow. Well, you said uh, in an interview I heard that characters can be, like, the best way to identify with a character is by their silhouette. Like, you know who they are. And I think you referenced The Simpsons. Like, you know who Marge is, you know who Homer is. Has any fan ever drawn or made a silhouette of your character? Oh, yeah, a lot. Yeah, a lot of the time. Yeah, I'm, um, that's the one thing I would say. Like, my, uh, I get a lot of stuff from fans, especially fan artwork. And, you know, and sometimes they write quotes and stuff on there that I haven't even said. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to take that. Like, a lot of my ideas have actually come from the fans because they'll either do some artwork or whatever. But, yeah, like, I literally, I, I was at, I was at, I was at the last week and someone gave me this massive uh, frame and had painted my silhouette. Funny enough, you should ask. They painted my silhouette and put, like, this villain quote next to it. It was really cool. But, uh, no, I'm very fortunate in terms of the fans. I think that's... Um, a big part of the fans, the reason why they enjoy me is because it's like, I guess it's a fun character to kind of either draw or I don't know. But no, uh, yeah, that is, um, that is a true quote from me. All great characters can be recognized from the silhouettes. There we go. <laughs> so my true. last question to you, who's your favorite villain of all time? Oh, I don't know. You've got me there. <laughs> like, uh, my favorite rest is... Um, a lot of my favorite wrestlers aren't the obvious ones. Like, I'm a massive fan of uh, Kerry Funk, uh, Roddy Piper, uh, Brian Pillman. There's kind of, you know, controversial characters that kind of made you second guess if they were actually crazy or not. Um, you know, Sean could probably confirm because he's probably what those guys find oh, not. Yeah. But those guys, I really enjoy. In terms of wrestling villains, those guys. Awesome. Um, well, you were at a thing in England where... Paul Heyman pulled uh, Will Ospreay to offer him a contract and then said how much he admires your work. How did you feel at that moment? What was that experience like for you? Uh, that was great. It was cool because um, I guess uh, someone had emailed me maybe that day or, or the day before to start saying, oh, Paul Heyman would like you to, to kind of show up. Uh, to his sort of, uh, He did like an evening with Paul Heyman. And uh, I was like, okay, cool. Like, I'm love Paul Heyman so yeah I got to turn up got to meet Heyman before the show and um, you know he gave me some really cool advice and uh, I took his business card and I spoke to him since like you know every now and then I might drop him an email or uh, you know if I need to pick his brains I'll, I'll email him so uh, yeah like I, we were planning like a few times I planned to meet him in uh, New York for lunch and stuff but it hasn't worked out obviously he's quite a hard man to, to get hold of but no uh, you know it's, it's, it's obviously great to have someone like that on your side Hey Marty, like looking looking forward, uh, uh, you know everyone's like kind of always ask, hey, uh, uh, is your goal to go to WWE one day? Um, I'm assuming that you wouldn't mind going there at some point, but uh, but what is your like like what's your like more like sh short term future goals? Um, I think it's been more so in recent years. Like I've always wanted to be successful in wrestling obviously and yeah. make loads of money but I think these days it's a big part of it for me is just trying to sort of captivate and, and exhilarate an audience and try and, and not only that especially with the stuff I'm doing lately with, with Kenny and, and the Young Bucks is we just want to make wrestling fun again as well we want to do stuff like kind of like what you guys did back in the day during the actually it made such a shift 
in the way this business went and you know its effects will kind of last forever so that's kind of what I'd like to do now is we kind of want to not necessarily you know change the wrestling business but we want to kind of you know help it grow help it evolve we want to you know revolutionize the business and I think what's interesting is it like that certainly you know things like this hot topic deal and everything else is going on that seems like it can be quite possible and the really interesting thing is that we're doing it without being a part of like you know WWE or a massive company like that's that right. So uh, that for me is super duper exciting, just that kind of way we can, you know, it's so much easier now with, with social media and everything else. Uh, but yeah, just trying to put my stamp on the business, you know, trying to, you know, just for the brands, just trying to make, you know, really wrestling is awesome as it is, but, uh, you know, just trying to make it fun again for the fans and create things we've never seen before because there's so many hours and upon hours of uh, programming, of wrestling programming every week, trying to do something different is obviously, uh, you know, it, it's quite difficult to do. It but no, is. That's, it's, That's certainly something that I like to do. It is, it, it is so difficult to stand out in wrestling, and, and it takes more than just doing incredible moves. And uh, and and you're totally doing it, man. You and and your compadre, that you know, uh, the Bucks, uh, Kenny Omega. Um, he went, Marty. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And 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 uh, do you have any social media stuff or, or like you know your your merch or anything that that that, that you can plug in the show so our uh, our listeners and viewers could uh, patronize you? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I'm at Marty Scale on the uh, Twitter and Instagram, S E U R W L. And then uh, in terms of merchandise, uh, ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Marty Scale. And there's also Villainous. Uh, sorry, villainenterprises.com. Don't even know my own website. Villainenterprises.com, where you can pick up all your wrestling merch, including the uh, the Bullet Club umbrella. So uh, yeah, and obviously nice. we have our uh, YouTube show, Being the Elite. So if you guys want to give it a, a like and a subscribe and uh, catch up more the latest on there, that'd be great as well. Marty, thank you so much, man. And and you already know I'm a big fan of yours, and uh, and I'm really like looking forward to. Watching all the stuff you uh, you still haven't done yet, man. So uh, thank you so much, Marty. Well, thank you, Sean. It's been great. It's been, uh, it's been an honor to be on the show. So thank you very much. Thanks, man. Thanks, and uh, thank and I hope you get some rest. I know, like uh, you coming on the show after you, you're probably still jet lagging, man. Thank you so much. Have a good have a good one, Marty. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Sean. Bye. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Thank Sweet. you, guys. Cheers. Thanks, Marty. Bye. Right on. Wow. All right. You want to go into a commercial? Or you want to just get out of here? Um, well, I, I guess we can just kind of keep this thing going, man. And I just wanted to, I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Was, you know, you guys cool. know I'm a big Marty Skrull fan. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask him what it's like growing up a fan of yours and now you're a fan of his, how that feels for him. <laughs> um, you know? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I guess time. you should have asked yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to put something out there to our fans. I would like a silhouette contest for you guys to draw a silhouette of X-Pac and send it to us, and Whoa. we'll pick a winner, and we'll send them something cool. I think that would be awesome. That sounds great. I love. You it. mean like like, like this, these Bola like, PWG cards? You yeah, have. I have a I have a uh, a pack unopened pack of Pro Wrestling Gorilla Bola 2017 trading cards. Yeah, so it's everyone who was in the tournament has their own trading card. Yeah, and I think oh I think High Spots is gonna be selling those down the line, but those are probably going to be hard to get. Yeah. So definitely send us your silhouette of X-Pac, and you might win. Yeah, I'm, I definitely want to send these to somebody because I will just lose them. <laughs> 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 hey, anybody, you guys, let's go run the horn here and make sure, because if we just leave it up to me, I'll like <laughs> just skip everyone's everything. All so right, go so ahead, guys. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Jimbo the Booth. Come check out Bar Wrestling tomorrow. I'll be there with Sean. Come say hi. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at underscore Denise Salcedo, and I will be at Championship Wrestling from Hollywood September 10th. We are having a free taping. And you can follow me on all social media at Sonoma Hotel, and make sure that you check out withspandex.com. Especially make sure that you check out this week's McMahon Splaining with Spandex podcast because we got Titus O'Neill on there, and um, it was a really great conversation about stereotypes in wrestling, about race relations in America, about what he's doing for helping out ask at, at risk youth um just amazing conversation so great to talk to that guy yeah 
And you can follow us at AfterBuzz TV on Twitter, The Real XPOC, uh, IG, XPOC12360, Facebook, XPOC12360 Show. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. You also can go on celebvm.com slash Sean Waltman to get all the personalized messages and all that good stuff. Don't really get to leave five stars on iTunes and all the comments on YouTube. Whew. Pro Wrestling TV slash Sean Waltman. And you can follow me at TK Trinidad for everything. And also, we do have the May Young Classic, too, so you can uh, check us out on AfterBuzz. All right. Well, you can follow me at The Real X Pac on Twitter. And we'll see you next week right here on X Pac. One, two, three, 60. From executive producers Maria Manunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, Sean Waltman, producers Jimbo Frank and TK Trinidad, managing producer of AfterBuzz TV Wrestling Mark Donica, and the entire X Pac 12360 staff, we would like to thank you for tuning in. Like us on Facebook, rate and comment on iTunes and YouTube, follow X Pac on Twitter at The Real X Pac, and email us at XPOC 12360 show at gmail.com. This has been a presentation of the AfterBuzz TV Network. Buzz you later!